Governance risk compliance, the GRC component of information security gets a bad rap in the cybersecurity game. This week I'm gonna throw some love towards GRC and tell you what you need to know about it to be successful, coming up. Hey everybody, welcome to Simply Cyber, the YouTube channel designed to help you make or take a cybersecurity career further, faster. I'm your host, Gerald Dozier, and I'd like to give a special shout out to our sponsor, Coastal Information Security Group, for uh, being our sponsor. Really appreciate that. Also in the background, a little shout out to Hackersploit, another YouTube content creator, an excellent, excellent resource on the internet. Uh, more on the bug bounty pen testing side, uh, but check out his uh, link below in the show notes. Um, just he's, He does amazing work. Um, and be sure to stay tuned to the end where I have my one cool thing segment where I share something completely, um, you know, what I think is cool and that I wanted you to know about. But let's get into GRC. So GRC or governance, risk and compliance is a critical piece of any mature information security program. So a lot of times the red team, the blue team, hands on hard skills, technical scanners, um, you know, hacking, passing the hash, like uh, popping shells, all that stuff. That's all sexy and cool. Uh, and it's definitely an important part of information security. However, um, governance, risk, and compliance has its place and it's equally important in some regards. Now, I will preface it by saying smaller businesses, smaller programs are not going to typically have a GRC component. They will have some compliance requirements in some situations, whether or not they're actually adhering to them or doing anything, um, due diligence, due care to meet them is a separate issue. GRC is gonna be for more of your medium size uh, organizations and definitely, definitely large enterprise organizations. So think Fortune 500 companies, there's absolutely zero question that they have a GRC component to their information security program and there's jobs there so that's why it's so important um, to a understand if you want to go into that particular field of information security but b having the context of what that function does even if you are a blue team or a SOC analyst or something like that it's important to understand that so what exactly is grc so grc is these three things right governance risk and compliance Governance is basically how the organization itself governs the way things are done. And you know what does that kind of look like, right? So that looks like, um, can anyone in the organization install any software they want on any system? Probably not, but there's rules around that, right? Can you go, can you go to a website on your lunch break? Can you bring in an Xbox and plug it in the network and have a LAN party? if people still do that, um, maybe, maybe not, I don't know. Those are acceptable use policies. And all of that is how the organization governs both its end users and its IT assets and its, its um, itself, really. Like what is acceptable behavior? What is the culture of the organization? And that's what governance is. It's not a tool, although tools can help you implement it effectively. It's not It's not a skill, it's, there's no GitHub repo for governance. It's it's. It's a organizational cultural element of how it's implemented, okay? So it's very difficult to wrap your head around uh, um, until, you, until you get it and then it makes sense, right? Um, next is compliance. Compliance is complying with whatever federal regulations, industry regulations, uh, whatever regulations and requirements you have to. So quick, quick big ones, for example, PCI, the payment card industry, they have their own compliance standard called PCI. So if you work at a business or an organization that takes credit cards, or you take credit cards, you have to comply with PCI. You, you don't have to, but if they find out that you're not compliant, they, the credit card companies, will restrict you from being able to use credit cards. So think about your food truck, right? And you're using credit cards, but you're not complying with a PCI standard. They could take that away and now you're a cash only food truck. I don't know, it's 2020. Where I am, I don't carry cash. So you, you're incentivized to comply with that standard because you want to be able to take credit cards. Another one is um, HIPAA, right? If you work in healthcare, or you've probably heard of it, HIPAA compliance. And, and basically compliance standards are a minimum set of security controls and or privacy controls or whatever. It's some minimum set of standards that an organization must 
implement to be compliant with the standard. And then there's a whole host of like um, a testing that you've implemented and then auditing and passing an audit and having an action plan for closing out findings where there's gaps, uh, you know, et cetera. So that is what the compliance piece of it is. Now, compliance and governance kind of work hand in hand because if you have certain things that you have to comply with, like, um, like I said with PCI, like all credit card data needs to be encrypted. Okay, so then you can have some policy that states all, cre all credit card data must be encrypted or all data at rest must be encrypted or whatever. So now you like you put the policy in place, but if people are like, oh, F off, like I, I'm not gonna follow that. I'm like a sysadmin, I don't have time for encrypting stuff or I'm the, I'm the, uh, the data uh, analytics person on our team and it's like inconvenient for it to be encrypted because I have to go decrypt it every time I wanna uh, train an algorithm or something like that. Well, now it becomes governance tone at the top, which is absolutely critical to any organization's success. Tone being the leadership who's defining what is acceptable behavior in the organization. Um, standing behind what the, govern the, the governance model of those policies and procedures are. Are you following them? And then ultimately, if you aren't, what they do about it, right? Sanctions, um, you know, terminations, etc. That's the only way it really works, okay? Third is risk. Now, um, spoiler alert if this is new to, to you, but you cannot be 100% secure ever. I don't care how good you are, um, national security systems, submarines with missiles on them, like there are vulnerabilities, whether it's human vulnerabilities, uh, attacking the human social engineering, whether it's technical vulnerabilities through exploitation, um, not patching, um, physical security, you can walk in and plug a USB drive in, whatever it is, there is going to be risk, some risk, right? But what is that risk? How do you, how do you qualify that? How do you quantify that? And that's what this piece of the risk uh, in GRC is, and it's actually uh, a, a fairly large one and, and one that gets a lot more attention than the other two. So risk is either assessed either qualitatively or quantitative. And that means you say like, we have some risk. Our, our, risk, our risk is moderate, our risk is low. It's some qualified subjective uh, value that people kind of agree on, but it, it's, not, it's, not, it's difficult to measure. Uh, quantifiable is measurable where you say, you know, uh, our risk was uh, of, of whatever is at 34% of risk and we're gonna implement these three controls and that's gonna reduce our risk to 17% and organizationally at the governance level, we're comfortable with 20% um, risk. Um, so quantifiable is a little bit harder. You need to be like a much more mature organization in order to have the metrics to support what that quantification is. Um, qualitative, you'll see a lot more often. Uh, a couple resources um, that I wanna share with you. Again, there aren't really tools um, necessarily within the GRC space, um, but, um, so NIST has some special publications that you should be aware of. 800-39, um, that is kind of showing you how to implement an organizational kind of risk management framework. It's not 837, which is the risk management framework. You can check that as well. But 839 talks about risk at the organizational level, risk at the system level, which is what most people think of when they think of like an unpatched system and stuff like that. Um, as you do audits and things like that, like you can, you have to do an audit, right? So let's say you're going to put in some controls, then you have to test the effectiveness of them because A, they might be configured wrong. B, you might have, uh, end users that are intentionally circumventing them for whatever reason. Once you assess them, you get some score, uh, and then you find out where the weaknesses are, and then you put an action plan in place to uh, remediate those, and then you have to report that up to leadership or the board or whoever uh, on where you are today and where you are tomorrow and what your plan is and how you implement. And then all of these things come with financial uh, obligations oftentimes where you need to um, uh, purchase a tool or purchase some access to some configuration baselines, for example, or something like that, or some knowledge, um, or, or hire people in order to implement or maintain appliances or get contractors to do it. So GRC is a big thing. It takes time. Again, it's, it's more angled for medium to larger organizations, although small ones do need to really worry about the compliance one. Uh, but from a governance and risk perspective, small organizations are typically in really even compliance. They're just flying by the seat of their pants. They're assuming that they're compliant with whatever standard or they're unaware of the standard. 
and they have a um, basically a naive uh, idea of what their current risk posture is and what they're willing to accept. And it's really naive because they're unaware. Um, and I, I'll just point out like, you know, whatever, shameless plug, my entire dissertation for my PhD was focused on this naivety of what their uh, risk tolerance was and what actually led to why that risk existed. Uh, so if you're interested in digging into a 200 page book I wrote on it, um, you, can dig, you can dig in there. Um, so again, uh, I just wanted to spend a minute this is important, right? So the blue team is defending, the red team is attacking, but like, what are, like, wh where should they focus their efforts? They can't defend everything, right? So governance and compliance and, and, and really what your risk profile is defines where they should spend their efforts or how you should spend your money on what controls and tools. Just buying the coolest new tool that's at Black Hat or like the vendor that has the biggest booth, yeah, you can do that, but like, is it, is it quantifiably, is it a material improvement to your risk posture or is it literally doing, you bought a PA firewall, now you're gonna buy a Fortinet firewall and you already got them. So it didn't actually improve your security posture, it just hit your budget, right? So GRC, it gets complicated, uh, but that's basically it. There are some tools that help you manage and communicate out to organizations what your policies are. Uh, but, you know, I, I, oh, another like quick pro tip, policies, like, don't write 400 policies for the sake of uh, compliance, right? You should write minimum a couple policies that are important to your organization and uh, communicate them uh, throughout the organization and have governance and senior leadership buy-in or else you're never gonna succeed with that. Okay, if you got any questions about GRC, put them in the uh, comments below. I'll, I'll answer them. I, I love engaging with you all. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to have spent some time throwing some, throwing some love and showering it, uh, the, the GRC to the side of the house instead of just new tools and cool uh, hacks and stuff like that. So now it's time for our one cool thing. My one cool thing is, I can't remember the name of it right now, but it's going. It's a uh, Netflix show I watched last night and it's actually really interesting. Uh, I'll put it right here, uh, I forget the title, but it's basically about how uh, social media companies have developed um, how, like basically how engineers have engineered user interfaces to promote uh, interaction and the time spent on the platform. Uh, there is like a whole kind of dramatic use case that they, they splice in periodically about like the abuse of, um, of how it could affect a family. It's a dramatization and I didn't care for that part, but they're interviewing like the president of uh, Uber and the, the CEO of Pinterest or former president of Pinterest and lead engineers at Google and interface engineers at Twitter, like high end, really smart, you know, Stanford graduate type people who are talking about the humane, uh, humane elements of technology and how, you know, like it, it, it's, 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 it's interesting. I'll, I'll put it this way. Uh, it's worth checking out. I personally ha um, spend a lot of time on my phone. You know, it's the first thing I look at when I wake up. I typically check it when I go to bed. Like I went in right after I was watching this or while I was watching it and disabled notifications on just about everything that I don't really care about. I left my, you know, messages and my email because that's how people normally communicate with me. But just all the superfluous app that wants to send you notifications and steal your attention and disrupt um, your, your focus on whatever it is. I, I, I disabled all those and I felt better about it. So uh, great little documentary, uh, recommend checking it out. Okay, thanks everybody. Uh, love, love engaging with you, love uh, doing the show. Um, and until next week, stay secure.